October 8, 2013, AMD released the Radeon R7 250, a GCN 1.0 card. It was around the same year that AMD decided to rename their latest HD 7000 series cards as various R7 R9 cards. I'll spare you having to go through the entire naming process, but I will touch a bit on the lower end of the lineup, namely the R7 250. You see, a lot of manufacturers decided to rebrand their older stock of HD7750 as R7250 as well. This meant that, at least for a while, when buying an R7250, you could get either a Cape Verde based one, or, like the version we'll be reviewing, the newer Holland XT one. The difference was not negligible. Cape Verde Pro had a higher shader count, more TMUs and ROPs, and it also had a brand new video encoding engine. Holland XT, however, had only 3 quarters of the shaders count, same percentage of TMUs and a paltry amount of 8 ROPs. So far, it is identical to the Cape Verde LE that powered the entry-level HD7730. However, if the Cape Verde version was paired with a DDR3 memory, the Holland one was blessed with GDDR5 making both variants of the card perform similarly. Both variants use GPUs built with the GCN 1.0 architecture, so in terms of API and drivers they are the same. They support Vulkan and game-ready drivers were released for them up until mid-2021, when it, like all its GCN 1.0, 2.0 and 3.0 relatives, were put on legacy driver support. Now, as I mentioned before, we'll be taking a closer look at the Holland XT version, that came a bit later after the Cape Verde. Unlike the older HD7700 series, the Holland XT variant of the R7250 does not have video encoding support. We'll also add to the mix the reduced PCIe bandwidth. If the older Cape Verde was using the full 16 PCIe lanes, the newer Holland uses only 8. Any similarities to AMD's existing current generation lower-end GPUs is purely accidental. Right. The Holland XT GPU has 384 shader cores, 24 TMUs and 8 ROPs, as previously mentioned. It is clocked 150 MHz higher than Cape Verde at a full 1 GHz and it can boost higher by 5%. The 1GB GDDR5 of VRAM uses a 128-bit bus to communicate with the GPU, and it is clocked at 1150 MHz. The expected power consumption for this card is 65 watts, so the card does not require any external power connector. Because the TDP of the card is similar to a mid-range processor, nobody should be surprised by the cooling solution used here. A simple aluminium block, most likely a slice from an extruded rod, and a two-pin fan. The entire thing is eerily reminiscent of an Intel stock cooler. Even the fan has that upside-down look where the stator is on top and the rotor is on the bottom. Since it uses a 2-pin fan, the card cannot report the RPM properly. The number scenes during a heaven run are completely bogus. However, the power delivered to the fan is PVM controlled, so it will allow different RPMs according to load. Despite using a cheap cooling solution, the card does not heat up under load, and remains at 67C in heaven for a delta over ambient of 43C. Same numbers in Warframe read as 71C for a delta over ambient of 47C. However, these values were captured with the original dried up to a rock thermal paste. A fresh serving of paste and the values are expected to go down a few degrees. Before going into the gameplay performance, I'd like to mention another consequence of lacking both PCIe bandwidth and video encoding support. Recording gameplay has quite an impact on the car's performance, so all the gameplay footage seen here uses stock videos. The FPS numbers, however, are accurate and do reflect the car's performance. 
Apex Legends behaved somewhat mediocre at 1080p low settings, with an average FPS in the mid 40s and 1% lows of low 30s. Dropping the resolution to 720p brings up the average at 62 FPS and the 1% lows to high 40s. One thing to be noted for this game. The 65 watts tiny card managed to outperform the only 3 years older and almost twice the TDP Radeon HD 6850. Congrats for getting game ready drivers all the way up until mid 2021 I guess. In Call of Duty Warzone the average FPS at 720p low settings is 33 FPS and the 1% lows is 26. It's easy to blame it all on the R7250, but I remember a time when playing the Battle Royale training map in an earlier season would yield an average in the mid 40s. Anyway, an FPS in the 30s is ok for single player, which Warzone is not. Keeping the trend that was noticed with previous cards, Battlefield 5 behaves a bit better at the same 720p low settings, but still in the realm of single player experience with an average of 37 FPS and 1% lows of 19. Control at 720p low settings can be played by single player standards, but the experience may not be entirely smooth. The average FPS on a run between ventilation and the power plant is 33 FPS, while the 1% lows is of 16. The stutters that the latter value indicates happen when moving from one area to another. I did not notice them during combat. Rainbow Six Siege will break the 60 FPS average on low settings only at 720p. At this resolution the 1% lows are between high 40s and high 50s, depending on the resolution scaling. 1080p drops the average to anywhere between mid 30s and low 50s, which will not be enough for a competitive multiplayer title. Alien Isolation was the game that put the R7250 on my radar as a good entry level card. While I played it at 1280x1024 with high settings, in this test we ran it at 1080p ultra settings. The average FPS almost reached 40 and the 1% lows came in at 25. This is already adequate for the single player title and if 60 FPS is a must, some settings can be dropped. CSGO runs well on slower hardware, or at least that's what I kept saying in other videos. The R7250 definitely qualifies, but the values I got at 1080p low settings might raise some eyebrows. The average in the mid 80s is fine. The 1% lows however of 37 FPS might put you in trouble. Dota 2 however vindicated the R7250 by providing an average of almost 120 FPS at 1080p low settings. The 1% lows of 71 FPS are also good and the game runs without any issues. The average FPS in Fortnite at 1080p low settings, performance mode and rendering distance set to far is quite adequate for the title with values in the low 70s. The 1% lows however lacks a bit at 19 FPS. Ideally you'd like to have these closer to 40 but even 720p will not increase these minimums higher than 35. Rocket League is a forgiving title and it shows with the R7250. At 1080p low settings the card averaged 81 FPS and had a 1% lows value of 31. This is probably more due to the camera switching while rendering the replay rather than actual in-game stutter. Splitgate struggles at 1080p low settings with the average at 38 FPS and 1% lows at 17. Definitely not recommended for multiplayer and the only way to gain performance is to drop the resolution to 720p. This will raise the average to mid 70s 
and the 1% lows in the mid-50s, which is much more adequate for the multiplier title. The spike planting training mission from Valorant produced an average of 213 FPS at 1080p low settings. With the 1% lows values closing to 120 FPS, the R7 250 will allow a good gaming experience and you may consider increasing the visuals. Genshin Impact runs an average of 45 FPS at 1080p low settings and a render scale of 1. The 1% lows is 33 FPS, which allows the game to run acceptable for a single player title, but with little options to improve visuals. Paladins produces good numbers at 1080p with a mix of settings. Averages go as high as 123 FPS and 1% lows reach low 70s. The game experience is good, so one can play a bit with the game settings. Not all games that we tested can afford this though with the R7 250. Realm Royale did not produce the same results. The larger map and larger pixel count proved to be a tougher challenge for the R7 250. The average at 1080p with settings on the higher side was 55 FPS and the 1% lows was 30. It may prove useful to bump down the resolution to 900p to avoid any performance issues at the wrong time, or drop some of the visual settings. Rogue Company is at the edge of a good multiplayer experience. The R7 250 produced an average in the mid 50s at 1080p low settings and a 1% lows value of 36. It is likely that a bump down for the resolution to 900p will improve these values, but even at 1080p the game played well. World of Tank Blitz will unsurprisingly stay at 60 FPS on average at 1080p, and the 1% lows of 52 FPS point out that this slow paced multiplayer title gets along well with the R7 250. For Warframe, the Mariana mission at 1080p low settings run at an average of 51 FPS. The 1% lows of 39 FPS allows an acceptable gaming experience for a PvE type of title. Tastes may vary though, so keep these numbers in mind when making a decision to use the R7 250. Used GPUs will always be good as a stopgap solution, until you get the money for the GPU that you really want, but that is as long as the market is fairly stable. And once the GPU of your dreams comes knocking at your door, you now have the option to resell the old GPU to recover most if not all of your initial investment, again, as long as the market is stable enough. APUs are touted as a better solution than using an old GPU, however, the iGPU does not come for free. You either pay for it in performance of the CPU, or in play money, as is in the case of Intel. In case of AMD, the iGPUs in their G series of Ryzen APUs are quite good. But without a non-G, non-X equivalent CPU, it is more difficult to assess the cost of their iGPU in either price or performance. In the case of Intel, however, the difference is exactly 25 USD for their Core i5 line of CPUs. And up until Alder Lake, for 25 USD, the odds of buying an old discrete GPU that beats the i5 iGPU are quite good. Do I need to mention that you can even increase that budget if you plan to resell the old GPU? The R7 250 was a budget entry card in the R7 R9 lineup of video cards from AMD. The chip manufacturer pulled no stops in cutting down costs while trying to maximize performance, from removing the video encoding capabilities that were present in the previous generation HD 7730 to cutting down the PCIe bandwidth. The butchered Cape Verde LE chip was then labeled as Oland XT and was clocked 200 MHz higher, raising the TDP from 47 watts to 65, 
and also gaining in pure gaming performance. As Philip states in his excellent video, see the link in the video description, AMD was forced to play catch up with Nvidia and it showed in the confusing R7 R9 lineup. Unfortunately, removing the video encoders and reducing the PCIe bandwidth was not a one-time trick for AMD, if the recent RDNA 2 entry-level cards are to be taken into account. The Sapphire R7 250 was the first GCN card that I had. It surprised me when it allowed me to play Alien Isolation and later on other titles including Fortnite. I had a bit of regret selling it, so when the opportunity presented itself, I bought back another 250. The card still surprised me today with its performance, unlike the previous years however, I became quickly aware of its lack of support for video encoding. But even with its shortcomings, the R7 250 remains a card that still brings back fond memories, providing acceptable gaming performance for a card with no external power connector.